Hey friends, if you're enjoying these amazing breakout stories, hit subscribe, leave a review, and while you're at it, throw us a five-star rating. It really helps the show and we love hearing from you. Thanks so much. Anger is telling us something. It's often telling us that something isn't right or that a boundary is being violated. So I don't want us to keep raising generations of young people who are afraid to explore their anger or express it. That's Kara Tuttle, a lawyer, consultant, and educator focused on addressing sexual assault and harassment in higher education. After years of working on a university campus, she found that assertiveness was a key struggle for women of all ages. Most of the people who come through my center are women, and they've been raised to be well-behaved, they've been raised to be pleasant, which delays them in asserting their boundaries. In 2021, Kara released Drowning in Timidity, Women, Politeness, and the Power of Assertive Living. The book examines the roots of the problem and provides tools to access the power of assertiveness in all of our relationships. In this episode, we really get into it with Kara, all of it, why anger is a good thing and why that anger is so complicated for women, the small things you can do to create big change. And we even dive into the life-changing power of quality sexual education. Kara has a lot to say and as usual, so do we. Welcome to The Breakout, a show about smashing through life's little boxes and forging your own path. I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. And I'm Kelly Gunther. Carrie and I are people and change experts and best friends. We've spent more than 25 years helping organizations navigate change and get the best out of their people. Come on, we know change is hard, but staying the same can even be harder. On The Breakout, we prove that you can escape expectations, and best of all, we show you how. We're so excited you're here. Tell our listeners what you help people break out of. Thank you so much for having me. I'm the author of a book on assertiveness that came out a few years ago, and that really came out of me working primarily with women, um, ages I'd say 18 to about 55. And I am trying to help them break out of conditioning or socialization or the hesitation that that comes with feeling the need to be pleasant and polite and avoid conflict, which then results in a lot of us holding ourselves back, holding our feelings and not addressing issues in relationship. I was doing this in the workplace where people like, can I talk to you for a minute? And we'd brainstorm the problem solving. But I was having the same conversation over and over and noticed people were having so many questions that go beyond salary negotiation. You know, they want to cram and be assertive for that small moment, you know, and then let it go for three to five years until they think they need to be assertive again. And so (laughs) I just kept thinking, like, we can do better than this. And it really should be a daily practice, which will then help us live authentically and build healthier lives and relationships and hopefully get, you know, both our wants and our needs met. Yes, I love that, that we're assertive every three to five years for salary, then maybe not, then we'll just hope and pray and then hope people read our minds. Well, you do a lot of work with young women, you're at Vanderbilt, and talk about what you're seeing with women in assertiveness. What are some of the patterns, some of the stories you can share? Sure. So at Vanderbilt University, I'm the director of an office that is called the Project Safe Center for Sexual Misconduct Prevention and Response. And so we provide a lot of consent education, bystander intervention education, healthy relationship education, and we provide survivor support services. In my office, we know the realities of our systems, which aren't yet very good at handling a lot of of issues related to sexual harassment and coercion, especially across power differentials, sexual assault. And that's what got me in front of a lot of audiences. And, you know, I'm very passionate about those issues. But what's underneath there, which people aren't always connecting, is that assertiveness and boundary setting piece. So, When I was early in my career, I worked in university women's centers. Um, I'm a feminist lawyer in my approach to the world, but it was more general. So we'd do the like salary negotiation workshop. We'd have conversations on pay equity. We would advocate for 
for new parents to be able to nurse on campus and have space to do that, better parental leave. But since 2014, I've really honed in on this issue and have been focused on addressing sexual misconduct specifically. And some of that we can't prevent. Some people are just Mm -hmm. trying to violate our boundaries and are really intent on doing so. And so in no way do I want any of my message to come across as, as victim blaming, because we have to know that reality, right? So it's not as simple as many of us were taught to near our attacker in the groin or yell fire and, you know, <laughs> and think that that's going to solve things. There's a lot of complexity and ambiguity in the lead up to a lot of these incidents. And so I always want to be very careful and thoughtful about the ways in which we're approaching the work of risk reduction, which there is some room for, right? There, there are some lessons to learn and there are some tactics, but also as humans, we're really good potential bystanders who can intervene, who are seeing things happen, who are pausing and saying that's not right. And so we can care for each other, but that takes some assertiveness too. And then outside of isolated incidents, we're in relationships with other people and we need to communicate and articulate our our wants and needs and our boundaries and reinforce those boundaries to cultivate and maintain healthy relationships. And so again, for me, I, I kept coming back to assertiveness as a piece of the conversation that was often skipped over, but is really a basic building block of addressing this on campus. And so most of, of my audience or the people who come through my center are women and They've been raised to be well-behaved. They've been raised to be pleasant, which delays them in asserting their boundaries. And so I was like, well, let's start to like unpack this, hopefully at an earlier age than, you know, I'm a a Gen Xer. So a lot of us are are doing this work in our 40s or 50s. I'm trying to get it to them in their 20s. I would love if we could get ahead of that even, but the K through 12 work (laughs) belongs to someone else. (laughs) Working on her book, Kara realized there was a gap in resources on assertiveness for women. I think the first wave of assertiveness training that I know of was in the 70s with the women's movement, and then it died down for a while. And then in the early 90s, really sparked by the treatment of Anita Hill during those Supreme Court Mm -hmm. confirmation hearings, we had this huge surge of interest for women in the workplace to take all kinds of trainings, right? So then that, that was trendy in a good way, long overdue, needed, but then it too died down. And I thought, you know, this is coming back. This is what they're asking for without knowing that they're asking for assertiveness training. I certainly had to live this journey on my own to build the life that I wanted. And I just thought I wanted to write an accessible guide that covers the basics It does give you your salary negotiation how-to in there, but it's so much more than that. And what I hope to add to the conversation, which are the final chapters in my book, are, okay, let's move beyond my individual personal development or cram session and have the sense of collective responsibility that like, when you get what you need, you bring others up with you or you take it, you know, further in a way that's improving our workspace or improving your community, because we really should be using it to change the world for good. We've got to just keep the work going. We'll get back to the interview after this quick break. The breakout comes to you from a Brachi group. We offer coaching and consulting to help you dig into change. Here's what we know. Only about 10% of us are really self-aware. Without self-awareness, improvement is tough because if you don't know what box you're in, you can't break out of it. That's where we come in. We've got a soft spot for people itching to forge a fresh path. The high flyers who need to be nudged out of career ruts. Teams who are looking to become more aligned. And yes, even those bold souls who've occasionally worn the jerk badge. Connect with us at abracigroup.com. Yeah. When I was reading some research about you and what you write, which is really interesting, I want you to get into it, is how you talk about accessing your anger and how that can free yourself. Because that anger, when I read it, I was like, ooh, I love her. Because you know 
As females, we're not supposed to be angry, especially female people of color, because, ooh, she's an angry one. Like, that anger word is so attached to men, and they can be angry, and they can be passionate. And for us to turn angry... So tell me about like how you deconstruct that and how you look at that, because I am, I think, passionate, but it could be angry about stuff, too. I don't know. Kelly and I have very passionate discussions about things (laughs) and why we're so passionate about the state of society. (laughs) I bet anger's underneath some of that. You know, I I bet it is. Oh, yeah. (laughs) So, you know, it it can go awry. You know, I don't want to oversell it. I don't want someone to live in their anger to the point where you're like bitter and resentful and tense, but I don't want us to suppress it or ignore it either. And I'm glad that stuck out to you. This is the moment like when I'm doing a lot of talks that the audience kind of, they laugh, like they enjoy me being the feisty presenter on the stage and they laugh and they have their, their moment of like, yeah, but then they aren't really sure how to take it home with them. Right. Um, Because we've really been taught to, I, I think, mostly suppress it. And I talked to a lot of parents and, and it's like, are you, are you still saying things or, or wanting to raise children to be seen and not heard? And some of them are like, yes, or like, that's the dream and that's not my reality. Um, <laughs> but I, I tell them, I was like, I like angry girls. I, I do. Yes. I mean, I'm sure I'm a better adult daughter <laughs> than I was as a teenager. You know, that that angst, I'm glad it wasn't disciplined out of me or or shamed out of me or anything, because it's actually a signal, right? So like it's coming from somewhere. Anger is telling us something. It's often telling us that something isn't right or that a boundary is being violated. So I don't want us to keep raising generations of young people who are afraid to explore their anger or ask questions about what it means or express it. Now we have limits on how we can express it. There are reasonable ways, there are proportional (laughs) responses, and there are disproportionate responses. But the feeling itself is not necessarily problematic. So, and I had to do this myself, you know, the feelings were there before I found authors and theories to put behind them. And that was really helpful to me, because I took things personally, also. And it, in law school, I would get really attached to, I mean, I, the injustice of some of the cases just stuck with mm-hmm. me and the human stories in the cases. And I say I'm fueled by anger. It's a go-to emotion for me. It's a comfortable emotion for me. For a large part of my life, I was trying to not be vulnerable and not cry, but anger was loud in my family dynamic growing up. Now that's not necessarily healthy, but it was comfortable for me. And I'm glad. I think it's probably a miracle that I've found a career where I get to channel that in really useful ways. But because so many women come through my office and talk to me and the victim advocates on my team, it just, I, you can see how long it takes for them to get to their anger. And mm. that's a really good part of healing. It's, it's a, for me, I'm, uh, I'm less concerned about the angry people, angry survivors, because there's a motion component to this, right? So all reactions are valid and people cycle through them kind of the way they do cycles of grief that, you know, people seem to know about. Because I understand if there are days you don't want to get out of bed. I totally understand that. But where I see advances in their coping and healing is when they can touch into anger. And then they are much stricter going forward about boundary violations. And Mm -hmm. so if you can cycle through the trauma that happens to you and go through an anger phase, which I don't see written about a lot, and, and, and I'm sure there are some mental health professionals who might disagree with me, but where I sit in my line of work, it has seemed like a life saving phase for people that helps them figure out how to make meaning or live in a new way you know, after trauma and respond much more quickly when people are trying to violate your boundary in in some way or coerce or pressure you. So it wasn't academic research that really led me there. It was, you know, the practitioner 
experience, which I think is incredibly valuable because we see the humans Mm -hmm. navigating these experiences. We see we're with them. We help them. Now I've been doing this for so long. I think there's no denying it, but we've been taught to be pleasant. We've been taught to be passive aggressive. Even that seems to be everybody's go-to favorite tool. That's our anger. Yeah. For a while. And then what? Mm Mm-hmm. We're resentful, we have insomnia, we have anxiety, we might drink, we channel it in a lot of different ways. And so it's about figuring out, okay, I'm going to let the feeling come up, I'm going to feel it, I'm going to think about it. I love a venting happy hour with my friends, that's a great coping mechanism for me. Then I don't send the angry email, I go home, I calm down, and the next day I approach this with strategy, right? And the anger is the fuel behind it, but I'm trying to figure out like, okay, I disagree with this. I don't approve of this, but I need to be persuasive in this situation. How can I harness this? And that's where I try to do that through assertiveness. Yeah. The professor that I was mentioning earlier, he also had a great quote. He worked with at-risk high school boys and at like a residential high school. So like really at risk. And he loved working with the angry boys because he said the boys who were angry had hope. He's like the ones who were quiet and checked out. He said they were kind of over it, but he's like the angry ones still had hope. And so I always equate this anger with hope because you want to change it. And Kelly, I was thinking, Arch, instead of calling ourselves a Brachi group, unconventional consulting, maybe we could say a Brachi fueled by anger. (laughs) <laughs> because we're like always like the injustice of it <laughs> because we have the same in human resources, right? We get very upset with the injustice of either an employee to an employee or an organization to an employee. We have a lot of pissed off conversations. I am pissed off on a regular basis. That's why I'm like, people see me stomping across campus and I'm like, yeah. Now, I mean, now I'm a white woman doing the work. So as you mentioned, I am allowed some space Oh, yes, that's 100 percent. And they Mm -hmm. think, oh, she's feisty. She's passionate. But but I have some grace because they know what my job is. But also for a lot of people, it's because I look like them when I have all of this aspects of identity that do come with that privilege. So you mentioned it, but it's important to note that not everybody can fuel it or harness it or direct it in the same way. I think she's one of the first females that I've really heard. Doesn't mean she's the first one to say it, but like for me, like just resonating with tap into that anger because Mm -hmm. usually it's such a negative. And again, of course, like we talked about being a person of color with anger is very different from being a white female with anger. But I still love, even if you can't express it sometimes to get in touch with it and kind of honor it. Everyone has emotions, but the amount of men at higher levels that we have worked with who are angry and do naughty things based on total emotion. And that is acceptable. A female steps into that or is slightly angry about something. They're like, oh, maybe it's her time of the month. Maybe like it's always so discounted. And I kind of want to talk about it more, Kelly. Like Mm -hmm. if I'm talking to females, like even to use more of that language, like, yeah, tap into your anger and it's fine. Like when Kelly and I do things like succession planning, we can say, yeah, good. She has every right to be really pissed about that. Don't you think? Just like you do Mm -hmm. when revenue is down. Well, the amount of energy that we have to take on as women to diagnose people and figure out, okay, I'm supposed to respond now based on how they're projecting towards me. So now I have to twist myself into a pretzel. It's a lot of mental gymnastics that you have to do when you're a female to try to figure out how do I get my message across in a way that people will understand, but I may have to compromise the way I would normally act or behave because of this person and their bullshit. My girl, Judy Rotan, who is so brilliant. There was a book in the 60s, and I wish I could remember it, but I'm so bad with details, as you all know. But it really was about why are women and people of color better at reading the room or reading the emotions? Because we have to. Yeah. Because for survival, we had to. We have to Mm -hmm. know if the husband was in a really bad mood when he came home so he didn't get beat. And so it kind of this generation of doing this and we're still doing it like that just sucks. And I say Mm -hmm. it all the time. I see my son. Guess who? What my son doesn't do. Doesn't do that. (laughs) He's not worried about like someone else's emotion or the freedom to be able to express yourself. Right. um, And be accepted for it. Right. And not be so harshly judged immediately with like, like, "Mm, I don't know if she should be that passionate. 
Except in the bedroom. Sorry. <laughs> then you can be. Then you could be passionate, lady. <laughs> That's about it, though. Kelly, I don't know how it's it landed for you, fueled by anger, but just a just a thought on our as we rebrand. I definitely like it because I have moments daily, sometimes in the car mostly, where I <laughs> am able to like let it out in a healthy way. And I also think about, you know, when we talk about HR, employee engagement surveys often reveal things that are either going really well in an organization or maybe not so well. And so to your point about if you're angry, you have emotion behind something, it means that you're engaged, invested in, in learning more or working through the trauma that you've gone through. And we often say the same thing in HR. When you have an employee who's disgruntled and talking about it and wanting to fix it, that's someone who has hope and wants to stay within the organization. Once you're checked out, it's very difficult to sometimes bring them back if you can at all. I think you cherish those like canaries in the coal mine, mm -hmm. right? Or the potential yeah. whistleblower. That's so interesting. I love this. There's a concept really in the in the work that we do on college campuses that extends beyond that, but it's a concept of institutional betrayal. So in the sexual misconduct land, it's like we saw it with the military, we see it with the Catholic Church and their treatment mm -hmm. of, of scandals. You see it in the Boy Scouts organization and the many scandals that have come up. And then we had this phase, which maybe we're still in about colleges and universities and the distrust there on how institutions are or are not responding to that. And there is a sense of distrust, which we have to address, right? It does require grappling with those angry, disgruntled voices in your community who are trying to tell you something. They are trying to tell yes. you something. They still care. There is a lot of hope. That's how I still do the work is there's hope behind it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have the energy to keep showing up and, and keep trying every day. What would you say, Kara, is the number one thing that you think needs to happen in order for women to grow within their own personal power? Is there something that stood out to you after all of your research and the work you've seen and done? I mean, this is maybe narrower than you mean by the question, but what I want more than anything, which is actually not the work that I do is healthy relationships training much early on in the public schools that we're terrified to dip our toes in the water of sex ed, you know, and that's so discouraging and disheartening for me. Really, schools in the United States just stopped doing it during the closure part of the pandemic, like in mass, because they were afraid to zoom that into homes, right? It's so Mm -hmm. risky, touchy, potentially upsetting to parents that it's hard enough to do it in person. So we took, in my opinion, insufficient, <laughs> inconsistent, non-existent <laughs> sex ed and went to zero in a lot of places. When it is done well, it teaches assertiveness and boundary setting, right? And that can extend to every type of relationship, personal, professional, so it's not, for me, just about romantic or sexual partners, but nowhere, almost nowhere, are people getting taught what a healthy relationship looks like. And then we skip over it for years. And so now, you know, I get college students who are bright and well-educated in some subjects, but we've skipped over the definitions, right? We've skipped over the basics. And so it's not just teaching them explicit things about sex, it's it's really about consent. They need to feel entitled to boundaries. Like we have rights. And I love it when young women feel entitled to those rights. They're supposed to feel entitled. That's how rights work. I want them to feel entitled in a good way of like, yeah, of course you can't do that to me. Of course you can't behave this way. Of course I deserve safety and bodily autonomy. And I don't know how we get there without addressing it much sooner before they're 18 years old and coming to college. And also everybody doesn't come to college. So this is not working as a society, as a patch on a broken system. But overwhelmingly, if I ask a group of like 1600 students, which I do every orientation, how many of you think you had good sex ed? I might get 10 hands out of 1600. And mostly they laugh and they're like, no. So for me, that's a huge, huge problem. Yeah, I remember back when I was in school, um, our we had human growth and development, which was basically the mechanics of what sex yields you if you are unprotected sex and all of that. So it's a scare tactic, you know, you yeah. can end up with a disease or a child that is not necessarily wanted. No, nothing about pleasure. 
<laughs> no, and nothing about like safety, just everything to kind of get you to not think about doing that and channel your energy to some other part of your life. You can learn what you don't like or don't want to do or don't feel ready to do yet, you know, and you will have words and strategies to, to live that way. It's not designed to make everyone engage in sexual activity at an earlier age, which is somehow how it's interpreted. And I'm like, no, no, this is a skill set that protects everyone, really. Right. We talk about so many subjects that you'll never use again. This is one that you will absolutely use yes. all the time. Such a like good it point. is how the world works. And I mean, I can't remember anything about trigonometry, but I'll remember how I handle relationships. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I just memorize things that I never use over and over and over in school. But actually, every moment of my day is in connection and sort of negotiation with another human. I gave a talk yesterday and they were like, what do you want to close with? And I was like, I, it was like women in business. And I'm like, there is no business that's not personal. It is all personal. We are persons. We are persons in relation to other persons. Every decision you make has a human impact. Our last question to close this out is, you have one minute, Kara, with someone who is stuck and they want to break out. What do you tell them? I mean, I would go back to the anger question. I'd be like, what are you angry about? What are you angry about? Sit with that, and you're, I want, you're going to come back to me next week, and I want a list of the things that you're angry about. We're going to start doing that. I love that you said you have a lot of processing in your car. I think that's a great place to start. Get in your car, you're by yourself, <laughs> turn on your angriest music, sing it at the top of your lungs, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, and like, that's the beginning of taking up space. You can start on the sidewalk. If you are walking on the sidewalk, this is a just mini assertiveness screening for you assessment. Are you the person that always moves? No, that's considerate. And there's sometimes we should do that. But are you always moving out of the way? If you're on a plane, do you ever get an armrest? Like start on those very basic things and you'll figure out where you are. Now, if you're very angry, I might go in a different direction and be like, how can we use this strategically? <laughs> you know, but for me, the conversation starts and we spend some time with like exploring that anger. Oh. Thank you so much for your sage words of wisdom um, and for using like really practical examples yes. of how we can start to assess ourselves. I do have an extra bonus question, but I did want to say, Kelly, I'm pretty sure Kelly listens to Nine Inch Nails in the car. Mm -hmm. I sure do. Kelly mm -hmm. is like, yep, I'm listening to Nine Inch Nails and we're getting it out. But I did have a totally kind of off topic, but you mentioned that you're a feminist lawyer. And what is your maybe advice or thoughts for all of us who are maybe, you know, not appreciating the way society is going with some issues, because being a lawyer is so important right now, because you are truly doing this work of fighting for all of our rights. So what could we non-lawyers do to really propel women's rights? What are your thoughts? I love that question. And my, my answer is, I do think it takes all of us. So there are some really curious and innovative work going on with like lawsuits filed on a lot of different issues. And that's important. Pick a movement. And there's always been this legal, you know, activism component of it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, support that when you can. And sometimes that takes a long time. But everyone should do what you can where you are with what you've got. Okay. And it might be very small. If someone is experiencing sexual harassment at work, and you witness it, support them. Please participate as a witness. I know it's scary. It's so disheartening for people who have been targeted or harmed to not have friends and allies in that. And that is life changing. And it's disappointing. I mean, you, you are an observer, you are a participant in life, no matter where you are, there is always something you can do. I don't want you to be unsafe. The concept of bystander intervention, and there are trainings on this, are really great for teaching you the very small things that you can do, no matter where you are, to address harassment, discrimination, injustice in your community. In the workplace, you can start with not laughing at the joke. You know, I mean, it can start that small. If you have the inappropriate person who's always pushing boundaries, who thinks everybody's too sensitive, you know, and that he gets to decide <laughs> who, what's too sensitive for everybody else, That's what true. we can at least do is not laugh at the joke. 
And if we're starting Mm -hmm. really small, just stare blankly and be like, I don't get it. And make them explain it. Because it falls apart. And make them, I mean, this is my favorite thing where I'm like, I don't get it. And then they're like, you see, it's racist. I mean, they're like, you know, then they're, then they're like <laughs> st- stuck. And that's something where you're not going to experience retaliation in your career because you didn't get the joke. Like that's actually very, very safe to do. It's a moment, but it disrupts the group dynamic. It calls them on their behavior in a really subtle way. So for the conflict averse person, start indirectly. If you have the safety that comes with identity, age, your title, whatever it is, you got to show up for people. You would want them to show up for you. But it requires a a shift in mindset because we've been raised to mind our own business. And that is not working for us. It does create change. I mean, those tiny things change a group dynamic, sometimes instantly. I love it. Thank you. That's the clip. Thank you so much, Kira. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It was so great. I feel like we could talk for hours. (laughs) That's Kara Tuttle, assertiveness powerhouse and author of Drowning in Timidity. And this is The Breakout from Abracci Group. At Abracci Group, we specialize in coaching and consulting for brave new directions. Connect with us at abracigroup.com. And don't forget to subscribe to The Breakout so you never miss a new episode. And make sure you're following us on Instagram at The Breakout Pod. I'm Kelly Gunther. And I'm Dr. Carrie Ulrich. See you next time. 